Okay. I mean, are we ready to go? Well, ready to go. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Steve Zanakis. Uh, Dr. Andrew Gerber, the CEO, was going to introduce our webinar today, but he is uh, out uh, for just a, mo a moment. He'll come join us later on. Uh, I want to thank you all for being with us. And uh, it's a pleasure and it's a privilege to be able to talk to you about our campaign. Well, there's Dr. Gerber. So I was uh, sitting in for you for a minute, if, uh, but let me just turn it over and you can open it up, open up for us as we uh, uh, talk to our, to our listeners. So Andrew, thanks for, for being here. Thank you, Steve. And I apologize to everybody. I, I'm sure you will all relate to uh, getting ready for a meeting and then realizing your Zoom doesn't work and the link isn't where you thought it was and then the computer freezing. So th those are all my various excuses. But, uh, and I apologize for my background not matching Matt and Steve's. Uh, their backgrounds are, are, are nicer than mine. But welcome everybody. I'm, I'm uh, as Steve was just starting to say, uh, it is a pleasure and a pri privilege to be here uh, to talk about the, uh, what we have been calling the COVID Resilience Campaign, and we are now starting to call the Community Resilience Campaign. Uh, this is uh, an effort that uh, has been underway at Silver Hill since uh, April of 2020. Uh, I don't have to tell all of you what a, uh, a, a unusual and stressful year this has been, but I'm very proud that um, when uh, the going uh, got tough, the tough got going, and that is who the, the CRC team is. I had the privilege of having met uh, uh, Dr. Steven Zanakis, uh, who you just met briefly, uh, in, in a, a previous role. And when we started hearing about the crisis in our midst with the pandemic, uh, I, I, I was very fortunate to have Steve as someone to call and to email and to say, Steve, what the hell are we going to do? Uh, what's happening in the world? And Steve, uh, partly because of his, his training and background as, as a military officer and as a, a retired brigadier general in the army, but even more importantly, because of who he is as a human being, uh, Steve thinks about uh, not what was me, uh, but how are we gonna help? And, and not how am I gonna help myself or my friends, but how am I gonna help everybody? How am I going to put something together that is gonna serve the community needs? Uh, and not just their needs today, as important as those are, but their needs next week, next month, next year. And as uh, has now all become a, a kind of truism and nobody even questions, uh, Steve uh, was talking about the coming mental health crisis in response to COVID and the pandemic from day one. And our very first conversation, he, he, he told me what was coming and he, was, he couldn't have been more right. Uh, he just said it calmly, he said it clearly, and he said, this is what we need to do. And so, uh, um, you know, so sometimes you know when to lead and sometimes you know when to follow. And in that moment, I knew to follow uh, Dr. Zanakis uh, and, and what he was talking about. So we brainstormed on how to put this together. We did. And then, of course, the next huge, huge thing happens, which is you've got to decide who to recruit to your team. And uh, again, uh, the credit I will take here is knowing, knowing the strength of my team members. Uh, Dr. Zanakis knows how to do this. He identifies talent and he right away identified two people. Uh, and you're, you're gonna, I know you're gonna see one today and hopefully you'll see the other one as well. Uh, Tara Reed, uh, who's trained as a nurse became our director of operations for COVID. Uh, Steve recognized her talent and her, her, uh, her drive and her, and her skill immediately and brought her on to really shape the program. And very shortly afterwards, he told me about Matt DeBernardis, who you're gonna hear from today, is someone with a huge heart and huge talent and someone who communicates beautifully well with a, a range of individuals. And so by putting that team together, in some respects, he put a, 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 a flexible tactical team that could respond where we needed it. So what did we need? And this is obviously important. Uh, we needed to reach out to those in the community who are at the highest risk. So that meant first responders, the people who were in the ERs and in the ICUs on those terrible days back last spring when, when the, the rates were skyrocketing. He quickly identified uh, for a variety of reasons that our, our policemen and our uh, ambulance drivers 
and, and our nurses and our social workers were also at risk and broadened the reach of that, of the programming to, to help them as well. And then last but not least, again, very early on, Steve and Matt and Tara realized that we had to help our teachers and we had to help uh, um, the, our, the employees at various companies who uh, didn't necessarily have the attention of the media or attention, uh, but were suffering in various ways as well. So in short, they, they saw how to stitch the fabric of society back together, just as it was starting to fragment. And I honestly believe that, that, that the number of people that they have reached is not in the hundreds or thousands that may be the physical people who showed up, it's in the millions because it's the people of the state of Connecticut and New York metropolitan region and nationwide who tuned in and were affected by all the different people that they serve. So it's really just, you know, it fills me with such, such pride and, and uh, pleasure to, to be uh, hosting this today. And from there, I'm gonna turn it over, uh, correct me if I'm wrong guys, to Matt, who's gonna take it from here. And I really look forward, I, I learn something every time I listen to these guys and, uh, uh, I'm looking forward to our program today and, I, and express my appreciation to them and also all of you for being here. Over to you, Matt. Great, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gerber, for the, uh, the origin story, a, a bit of an origin story on the program. And um, with that, what I wanted to do um, is talk a bit uh, more about the program itself. Uh, if I could just get the slides to work, there we go. Um, starting kind of with the, the 10,000 foot view of what we've put together to this point uh, in terms of our workshops and how um, those all came together and, and what they look like today. Uh, and then kind of work our way down into one of the tiers, which are the, the resilience package for those frontline workers that Dr. Gerber was alluding to. So the teachers, the nursing staff um, at hospitals and, and things like that, uh, as well as police departments, police officers. Uh, and first responders in general. And then I'll take you down into the weeds uh, and take you, um, give you a little peek behind the curtain, so to speak, with a couple of slides that come directly from our workshop, uh, just to share some content with what we're putting out into, uh, into the workshops. So um, with that, I'll go ahead and get started and then I'll pass it over to Dr. Zanakis who will walk us through some of the leadership modules that we've begin, uh, have begun to, to put into place. Um, so as Dr. Gerber alluded to, uh, this all started right at the onset of the pandemic uh, with, the, uh, with Dr. Znakis' leadership uh, and foresight to know kind of what, what the issues were going to be moving forward. And so when we talk to different organizations, it's really important for us um, to get a good idea of what's going on within the organization, whether that's a hospital system or a school system or uh, a police department for you know, a city or a town. Um, we picked up on some really common threads of, of stressors and things like that. But in reality, everyone has really responded not only to the pandemic, but to everything that's been going on in our country or on the globe for the past year in, in a different way. And they're affected in a different way. So it's really important for us um, to put our ear to the ground and, and have that initial meeting to really get an understanding of uh, you know, what's going on and how can we best serve. Um, and then what we do is we customize uh, curriculum to best suit that organization. So um, although we do have like a set um, uh, range of topics around different core components of resilience, which I'll share with you in a minute, um, it's customized to the sense that um, the application uh, of those skills and abilities and habits and behaviors uh, are all up to um, the end user. And so uh, we set the workshops up in a way that um, they're intimate in nature. So, you know, a smaller number, number of participants and as much as we'd love to be in person, we do these virtually as well, uh, where the audience is really um, the driver. Uh, the participants are really the driver of these workshops and sharing ideas and how can we apply the skills that we we teach and the content that we bring forward, how can we apply this to our life, not only in, in our workspace, but you know, in our home life, maybe with friends or family or loved ones. And um, the idea here is really to um, boost resilience overall and just a general sense of, of well-being uh, well and uh, taking care of, of our mental health. And so uh, with that, we've, we've continued to do workshops like uh, we've said over the past year uh, now. 
and uh, continue to gather feedback from every workshop that we've done, and as well as those um, early on, the, the meetings early on to gather um, some idea of, of what the need really is, we've come up with uh, a number of set topics and modules that have worked not only for uh, the frontline staff, where we've kind of like, that's the, the meat and potatoes of the, of the program to this point, but we've learned that um, where you stand in a particular organization, whether you're kind of in that C-suite level of leadership uh, or kind of a middle manager or, or that frontline worker, um, there are some, some different aspects to resilience that are important depending on kind of whether you're taking care of just yourself or you're, you're also looking out for um, you know, other people. And so um, with the guidance of Dr. Zanakis, we've um, been able to um, create a number of modules around uh, resilience for leadership and resilience for, for management. And I'll allow Dr. Znakis in a moment to, to speak to that. Um, but what I wanted to kind of take a deep dive into was uh, the, specific, the specific modules that we've created for the frontline staff, where we, where we really got our start and where we've built out uh, the most robust aspects to our program to this point. And it all really started, and it's really, it's been important for us as a campaign to lean heavily on science and, and really be research-based when we come to, um, you know, teaching skills and habits and behaviors. Uh, we want some evidence to back that up to make sure that it's going to, to obviously work for, for those of, that will be putting this into practice. And so this idea of resilience is not new, although for many of us, you know, the year 2020 was, was the year of resilience. We heard that term over and over and over again, uh, but it's actually a topic that's really been researched for quite some time now. And um, so what we've done early on is just take a look at what are some of the key components to resilience based on some of that, some of that evidence. Um, so it's the research has taken a look into, um, you know, longitudinal studies, follow people that um, would have maybe a trajectory of life that um, would not lead them to like high levels of success coming from, you know, um, you know, lower socioeconomic statuses or, um, you know, different uh, aspects within their background. But how did those folks kind of stand out amongst the crowd? And then other aspects of research looked into high performers and, and said, okay, what about them? Uh, what characteristics do these particular folks have that allow them to overcome the adversities in their life? And so, what we've tried to compile is, is sort of a list of core components of resilience. And each of our modules is, um, has been built so that they are, that there's some skills or habits or behaviors that work to build up on each of these six components. So I'll walk you through them briefly, but then I want to jump into what those uh, modules actually look like here in a minute as well. Um, so the key components are self-awareness, right? So just our ability to tune into our own thought patterns emotions and behaviors and how all of those are are intertwined. I had a great coach um, in you know peewee baseball once tell me that you can't change what you're not aware of and so we take that to mean like all right if we if we if there's some changes that we want to make in our life first we need to be able to take a look in the mirror and recognize like what about my uh, like so psychological framework it may be getting in the way of me being the best version of myself. And then with that, the kind of the next step forward would be your ability to self-regulate and not only regulate your own kind of emotions and behaviors in the moment, but be able to stick to goals long-term and, and adhere to, to plans and be able to deal with uh, changes in those plans um, and kind of putting your best foot forward that way. Uh, in addition to our ability to handle stress and kind of uh, engage in more of that like rest and digest and be able to kind of decompress at the end of a long day, a long week, or even during a you know difficult conversation, for example. Optimism is a very strong, I would say it's the engine of resilience. Um, the most resilient of us are optimistic. And um, I think for a lot of people, we get the, this idea of optimism all wrong. And for a lot of people, it's about, you know, our heads in the clouds and uh, it's just kind of this naive way of thinking, everything's rainbows and butterflies, but that's actually not how we think about optimism. Um, so true optimism is being realistic about your current situation while at the same time maintaining hope for the future. And so for this one in particular, I think a lot of people 
believe that I'm either optimistic or pessimistic or maybe somewhere in between, but that's just kind of like who I am. Uh, when in reality, each of these components can be taught and, and developed. And that's something that we're really excited about um, just because the, I think that's, uh, that's kind of a wake up call for a lot of people is that the, the pattern of behavior and thinking that I've been through can, kind of my whole life can be changed with some practice. Um, and then mental agility, uh, the next component is all really about uh, being able to see kind of both sides of the coin um, to avoid what we call thinking traps or um, navigate through some common biases. And, and I'll uh, talk about one of those uh, in a minute here. Um, but not just, to, so not just to say, okay, this is the way that I've always thought, this is the way that it's always going to be. How do I navigate around uh, some of those things? Uh, we also have strength of character. So when taking a look at the most resilient of us, um, we are acutely aware of what our particular strengths are, our unique blend of characteristics that um, make us good at what we do. And so this one is all about kind of taking a look in the mirror, understanding who we are, and what our core strengths are. And not only that, how do we bring those to the table with more purpose and intention every day? And so that's a great, I, I, mean, I love this particular uh, workshop that we do because it's all really about finding out what, what the best of us is and how to, how to bring that forward every day. And then finally, connection. If optimism is, is the engine, I mean, connection is, is just got to be up there with one of the more important components of resilience as well. I think for a lot of us, we've gotten it wrong about resilience for, the long, for a long time now. Um, and that is to say that resilience is once seen as, you know, overcoming adversity and challenges all on our own, being able to, you know, not having to rely on anybody else, kind of digging our heels in, and, you know, just uh, putting our nose to the grindstone and getting through it. When in reality, just the opposite is true. In fact, the, the most resilient folks out there have strong social connections and have the ability to lean on those folks in their life when they're in a time of need. Um, and more importantly, are also there for other people when they need them. Um, so having a strong relationships with others in your life is extremely important to resilience long-term. And so again, what we, what we do in these workshops is introduce some skills or habits or behaviors um, that are small, don't take a whole lot of work, but over time we'll work on building each of these components to um, help you become more, more resilient overall. And so what I would love to do is just walk you briefly through, um, kind of give you that 10,000 foot view of what these modules look like. So each of these modules is meant to be its own unique workshop that we put together. Um, so again, self-awareness and self-regulation, those two key components get their own module uh, because they are uh, that important. So in the self-awareness module, we walk through a model of how to understand the connection between our thoughts, emotions, and behaviors and map that out and identify patterns in our behavior. And again, we're not necessarily looking to make any changes. Maybe we're taking a look in that microscope and seeing, hey, what I'm doing is actually really working for me. Um, you know when I get into this particular challenge. And that's great too, to know that, that things are going well and things uh, you wanna continue uh, on that particular pattern. But um, this is also really important for recognizing like where do I want to make changes? And if that's the case, we walk through skills and self-regulation all about how to be purposeful on how to make some of those, those changes, as well as like I alluded to on the previous slide, um, ways to decompress. And I think for a lot of us, we are uh, working on overdrive uh, to a, little, <laughs> a little bit more often than we would like to be. So what are some things that we could do with the intention of helping us to relax a little bit more and uh, de-stress? And so uh, some of the things that we'll um, talk about in that workshop, I've actually snuck into this workshop. So uh, I'll save that for uh, a couple slides from now. Module three, all about motivation. So we've received a tremendous amount of feedback from our participants um, and prospective participants uh, about uh, this idea of lack of motivation and burnout and how those two are kind of intertwined topics. And so we talk a lot uh, about motivation and burnout in this particular uh, workshop and where do we go for sources of motivation? I think for a lot of us, we see it as 
um, like a quality, a, a quantity thing. Like I, I, I'm lacking motivation. I need more of it. Um, but sometimes the solution is just going to another, another source. Um, so it's more about like where you're getting your motivation from as opposed to uh, getting more of it. And so we talk a lot about um, motivation and burnout in, in module three. Uh, module four is called relationships. So it's all about connection, right? That component that we think is, is that we know is, is so important to resilience has um, a ton of different um, skill build, uh, skills to help build on relationships around communication and trust. And um, some of the content is really meant to be um, used within the, the workshop with, the, with one another, as well as brought home uh, to family members and brought into the workplace. And uh, we've seen a lot of great feedback from that particular workshop as well. Module five, all about sleep, right? We, we know how important this is on a, like an intuitive level, uh, but so mon many of us, uh, particularly like shift workers, like pol police officers and, and hospital staff um, are struggling when it comes to getting the proper amount of, of sleep. And, and luckily we have Dr. Zanakis on our team who has a, a lot of experience with cognitive, cognitive behavioral, behavioral therapy for insomnia. And so we've pulled a lot from the research there to help uh, folks learn about ways to improve the, the quality um, of their sleep, including power down routines and setting up their environment in a more effective way to get the best sleep that they can. And then module six, all about self-care. So uh, this is a topic, I think it's been kind of top of the list for, for many people is, is this idea of, of self-care. Um, in this particular module, we share a lot about what's working and what's maybe not working for us when it comes to self-care. And we've learned that it really needs to be supported on an organizational level. And so when we talk to leaders in our leadership modules, uh, self-care is also a way that, a, a topic that comes up quite frequently. How do we make this a more regular thing for people in the work workplace? But also what are you doing in your own time to um, you know, and, and restore your, your energy and, and, and things like that. So um, I think you know, with, with COVID, this is one that's been really affected quite strongly. You know, some of the things that we love to do, whether that's you know, go to the gym or hang out with, with friends on the weekends have all really kind of taken a step back. We, we can't do any of those things. So in this module, we talk about different ways to be creative with, with self-care and um, share with the team. I think there's a lot of secrets to success when it comes to self-care because I mean, you're doing it by yourself a lot of the times and maybe not talking about it as frequently as we should be. So um, this is all about kind of sharing ideas of, of what's working and, and what's not. And then our final two, two modules, module seven is all about values and character. So we talked about strength of character as one of our key components. So um, th in this one, we, we, we take a survey to learn a little bit more about what our uh, core uh, character strengths are. And with that, we talk about how can we bring the, the, the best version of ourself, uh, knowing kind of what our top character strengths are, um, you know, to, to work every day, um, or, you know, to our, to our home life every day, and really putting our, our best foot forward and, and leaning on our strengths. Uh, I think for a lot of us, we're so focused on kind of building up on our uh, weak areas or weak spots in, in life, that we lose sight of what we're really good at. And so this is kind of a workshop that is a great reminder for folks to um, tune into to their, their own strengths and, and uh, be grateful for, for what they are. And then finally, the Resilient Mindset uh, module uh, is all about um, the belief systems around skill development. So early on, when we started to talk about the components of resilience, there were so many uh, participants giving us feedback about, you know, I'm just not an optimistic person or, you know, my, I do not have the ability to be self-aware. And so it was important for us to create a module all about the, the belief systems around skill development, um, because the truth of the matter is that um, what we're talking about with these components of resilience is, are that they are um, teachable and they're, they're, they're learnable and you're able to develop these long-term. And so uh, it's important for us to um, kind of work around the, those thought patterns to get an understanding of um, how our belief systems may be hindering our own personal and professional development. And take that, you know, if you're in a leadership position, um, 
to you know help promote uh, highly motivated teams. And so we've seen a great uh, number of um, folks come back to us saying that that was an important module for for them when it comes to just their ideas about developing their own uh, their own skills. Okay, so I wanted to. Um, not only talk about what we talk about, um, but share a little bit of uh, what goes on in a module. So this particular slide is pulled right from our self-regulation module. And I wanted to share a little bit about some of the skills that we teach in, in um, when it comes to um, you know, down-regulating our, our physiology. Uh, so for many of us, um, we are operating kind of on overdrive where our, our foot's on the gas pedal and we rarely take time to take our foot off the gas, um, whether that's because we're, you know, working hard or we're particularly stressed out about things that are going to happen in the future or um, the uncertainty about the future itself or things that have already happened that maybe didn't go the way that we planned. And um, ultimately, there's, there's two systems, right? And, and many of you may be familiar, but we have the, the fight or flight system, which is one that kicks in in that survival mode when we um, kind of are working hard or are particularly like energized or stressed out. And then there's the rest and digest system, which uh, it kind of works as the, the balance to, to the fight or flight. But um, we, are, we are operating on that system much less frequently than frankly we should be. And so this particular slide is just chock full of some ideas on how to be more purposeful about spending time in that rest and digest zone. And the first and the, the, the most obvious and easily done is this idea of diaphragmatic breathing. And, and you've got the um, little image there on the bottom to kind of show you uh, what this is all about. So your diaphragm is kind of loaded, located right below the lungs in kind of your uh, stomach region. And diaphragmatic breathing is all about getting as much air into your lungs as possible and expanding on that diaphragm, it's really like kind of pushing your belly out. And what that does is it hits on the, the vagus nerve, um, which triggers that rest and digest response. Um, so if you were to do kind of a quick Google search on, on how to do this, um, you might get a number of um, responses back about you know, how many seconds you should be inhaling, how many seconds that you should be exhaling. But the truth of the matter is, um, getting the cadence down is important, but it's more about like what's most comfortable for you, particularly when, when you're starting off at this school at first. So I'm going to I'm going to talk you through it and then I would encourage you to all uh, practice this well for the remainder of today's session. I mean, we're breathing anyway. We might as well do some diaphragmatic breathing while we're at it. So uh, as the picture shows, it might be easy to just put a hand on your chest and a hand on your stomach. If that's uncomfortable for you, that's totally OK. Um, but this is just to kind of get an idea of uh, which hand is rising and which hand is, is falling. And um, you want basically you the hand that's on your chest to remain still while the, uh, stump, uh, the hand that's on your stomach to be the one that's rising and falling and taking a deep breath in through your nose. Now, my, my go-to cadence is a four second inhale and a four second exhale. So the inhale goes up through your nose and the exhale comes out through the mouth. So um, if you would like to practice that, just to kind of get, get an idea of uh, how that feels, uh, after a few minutes, you should kind of feel uh, nice and, and relaxed. On top of that, kind of a layer to this is the idea of mindfulness or a body scan. Uh, and with, without going too much into the weeds, just for lack of time purposes, um, a body scan is just ultimately tuning into different areas of our body kind of methodically, like scanning, like kind of picture a scanner, how it and it goes across the page. Um, you're, you're tuning into say like the top of your head for a few seconds as you're doing the diaphragmatic breathing before moving maybe down to your shoulders and your arms, your hips, your legs all the way down to your toes. And that's a way to kind of take your mind off of things. Uh, and mindfulness is all about tuning into a, a, like a central thought or focus point, uh, which could be you know part of your body or it could be that four second count of the cadence. Um, I, I highly encourage, this, being part of a routine. And when we get into the workshops, um, some of the things that we talk about are, you know, why this might work for me, like what are the benefits for me personally, but more importantly, like where and when can I do this, right? Is it more of like a morning, part of my morning routine or is it like a power down thing for me before bed? And it's different for everybody. Um, for example, some of the police officers that we've spoken to say that this is a really important 
skill for them to use in the in the police car in between calls um, because they may have like a really difficult interaction with a member of the community and they don't want to necessarily take that like um, tension with them to their next call and so while they're in their car they're doing some diaphragmatic breathing to help them to kind of decompress and move into the next call so i thought that that was a really interesting takeaway um, and it just shows how each organization that we work with are, are using and, and applying these skills in, in a different way. Uh, a refocus technique. This is great for anyone that um, may be having trouble like focusing on a particular task at hand. Um, say you're trying to write an email or put on a presentation and your mind is just kind of racing, um, you know, to the future or the um, stuff that happened earlier in the day. A refocus technique is one way that you can kind of Take your mind away from everything that you're thinking about to then refocus on uh, the task at hand. It's called see three, hear three, feel three because um, you're tuning into three things in your immediate environment that you can see, three things that you can hear, and three things that you can feel physically um, before then kind of recentering back on the task. So if I were to do it right now, I would see the printer on the desk next to me, this uh, the a lamp, and uh, I have a second screen with the presentation on it. Those are three things I see. Three things I hear. Luckily, I'm in a quiet office right now, so I can hear the sound of my voice. Um, I could hear there's like a bird chirping outside, and I believe some rain is, is tapping on the window. And then feel three, I got my, you know, my feet on my shoes, my hands on the desk, and my back up against the chair, right? So just a simple, quick way to uh, take my mind off of wherever it's at in order to refocus on the task at hand. And then finally, pro progressive muscle relaxation, or PMR. Um, this is kind of like a body scan in the sense that we're working our way through our muscle groups um, methodically, and we're purposely tensing and then releasing um, tension in, in our muscle groups. So I might start, for example, in my fists, and for four or five seconds, I might squeeze them as tight as I can before releasing. I might do that a couple of more times where I squeeze four or five seconds and then release. Uh, before moving on to the next muscle group. And so by the time I've worked my way all the way through my body, it's almost as though I gave myself um, my, like a massage, right? And it's a great power down routine. If anybody is a skier like myself and have ever had the joy of taking their ski boots off at the end of the day, that's kind of what your whole body feels like after a, a round of uh, progressive muscle relaxation. So highly encourage that one as well. And then the final skill that I just wanted to share with you before passing it off to Dr. Znakis is this idea of Hunt the Good Stuff. Hunt the Good Stuff is all about the component of optimism. So like I said, each of the skills are tied into, in some way, one of the core components to resilience. And this one happens to be optimism. So what we're working to do here is uh, get more gratitude in our life. And the, and the research on optimism is actually really strong and really interesting. And so... Um, what we found is that if we're able to purposely be grateful uh, throughout our day, every day, and make it a habit, we see some really tremendous benefits. And, and one of the reasons why it's so important that we do this is because it counteracts this idea of the negativity bias, which is as humans, we have this unconscious tendency to focus on the bad things and remember the bad things over, over the good, right? So if I'm taking a walk through a park and I see a lovely couple kind of having a nice moment on the park bench. Um, that might not be something that I even like pay attention to or tune into, let alone remember at the end of the day. But if I were to continue my walk through the park and a fight suddenly breaks out, my attention immediately will go there. And when I get home and I like see my spouse, that's probably the first thing I'm gonna talk about and remember from my walk on, on the park. And part of it is, is built into our, our, our system because it was a survival uh, mechanism, but you know when you know when we wanted to maybe necessarily like remember the the berries from a particular bush that made one of our friends really sick, but we're not necessarily worried about that stuff anymore. Um, but that part of our brain is stuck with us, and so what we need to do is is act and and incorporate some gratitude and look out purposely and hunt the good stuff in our day in order to fight that negativity bias. And when we're able to do that on a daily basis, long term we're seeing some really interesting benefits. So some of the obvious ones are some of the, the mental health benefits like greater happiness, um, fewer feelings of isolation, greater optimism, joy, pleasure. But on top of that, which I find really interesting is this idea of you know, getting better sleep, um, lowering your blood pressure. So you're seeing some, some physical health benefits associated with it as well. 
And so some of the ways that we could start to hunt the good stuff and, and do this skill is, is a little bit different from person to person, but uh, it could be things like journaling, like writing down three good things that happened today, uh, writing uh, gratitude letters to family members, uh, having, you know, um, like just giving thanks and, and praise to, to like coworkers or family members, really simple things. But the important thing is making it a habit and doing it every day, just like all of the other skills that we have in our resilience playbook. So um, with that, I am going to pass the baton, the, the virtual mic uh, over to Dr. Zanakis to, uh, to speak to uh, what we've been hearing so far and also what we've developed on the leadership side, side of things. Well, thank you, Matt. And uh, thank you, uh, Andrew. I want to salute you and thank you and the whole, all the staff at Silver Hill for supporting this program and, in fact, for pro help for promoting it and for making it uh, so uh, real for us and effective in the community there in Connecticut and other, other places that we've been able to uh, reach out to. Uh, we've been fortunate that the program has been underwritten by the hospital and by charitable donations uh, contributions, and that has really stood us up and kept it going, and it's a great credit to everybody for everything that they're doing. Uh, as you can tell, we're really committed to this, and the, the inspiration for it uh, and uh, the motivation for us has been that uh, we feel so strongly that the health and welfare of our friends, families, communities is vitally important to the strength of our country and our ability to not only get through this pandemic, but to get through all the other challenges that we're facing. And of course, that comes from what we've learned over many years in the military uh, it's a commitment to our soldiers and their families. And we ask these men and women to risk their lives to make the ultimate sacrifice. And we have a responsibility, obligation back to them to make their lives as good as they can be. So we've been privileged here to reach out to a number of community organizations. Uh, our estimate is we've talked to a thousand people over the past year. Uh, and it's uh, the positive feedback has been very gratifying and reinforcing, keeps us going. Uh, people like to hear Matt and uh, other times other trainers, but like to hear him and the practical applications. It uh, gives them skills that they can use every day in their lives, as says to them they're not really just floundering, they're at sea. Now they've got things that they can make routine. They've got habits and uh, they can go about more confidently, more securely in doing their work and in living with their families and friends. So this has been extremely positive. We of course want to keep it going. Uh, we understand that a, COVID has now passed through another phase, but we're different as a country. We've been changed. And uh, we're gonna be living with this now for many, many years. And of course, there are all sorts of other social tensions and pressures. And we feel that these kinds of skills, this kind of training is so important uh, to all the people out there on the front lines as as you said, our schools and folks like that and law enforcement. So uh, you can progress the slide there. Next slide, Matt. Uh, let me, let's, uh, I think we can all share the sense that uh, uh, we've, who knows what's gonna be ahead, uh, but I think we could, we'll talk about that. Let me go to the next slide. Uh, there, it's a, what we feel are some, it's important for our leadership. And we, I spend my time thinking about it as a leader uh, from my uh, army career is to understand what the needs and priorities are of the people that we're helping and serving, what are gonna be the obstacles and hurdles we're gonna face, 
uh, be able to maintain uh, some transparency about them, some open communication and feedback, and accordingly to go about and change our processes and practices so that we can be most effective. Next slide. Matt's spoken a lot about what we do on the front lines. Uh, what I wanted, what we're trying to explain here is that the work of the leaders, senior leaders, the work of the frontline leaders, uh, the management, uh, like in a hospital that runs the emergency department or runs the various departments, and the work of those people who are doing the actual care, all interact. Uh, in a world where we could manage by walking around, uh, we would be thinking about what the synergy is uh, of what we do as leaders, how we set vision and priorities, set goals, how we talk to our staff as management, how we then make sure that the people on the front lines feel that they're getting the support, they're doing the things that they need to do so that they're feeling better and they can do their jobs better and their lives are better. Next slide. Most importantly, and this is a responsibility in each of us who are in organizations as leaders is setting the vision. Now, that's not just some foggy idea. Uh, the joke is amongst us psychiatrists is, is this a vision or a hallucination? Well, it's actually a very methodic process. And that is that you can look out and understand what the mission is, understand goals and objectives, understand what the values and culture is, look at what the challenges and threats are, and accordingly, in a very systematic, methodic way, set those goals so everybody can do their job in the best way. There's a, a art here, and what is we've all seen is that good leaders know what that art is, and they can practice and make it extremely natural uh, in terms of how they help their organizations and push their organizations forward. At this time, it is vitally important because we've got to and have been in this pandemic, all the stresses, and we've, we are now in a situation to do what is, is vital to us so that we can have a life that is most gratifying and productive. Next slide. The vision is a, a, a laid out process that is done by the leaders. It is data driven so that the feedback loops from the front lines, from what they're uh, from their hearing and that the people that are doing the jobs are able to have input in a, and that means that leaders have to be willing to hear things sometimes that they don't want to hear, uh, but that they, in the end, are we all acknowledge are vitally important. And in that way, because the communication is open and transparent, that everyone is engaged in the process. Next slide. That is what sets the culture so that the leader articulates and affirms the mission, articulates and sets the goals and objectives, involves the staff, but in that way, the involvement, the mutual activity, the activity that people are building with each other uh, is, is sets a culture here so that everyone is confident that they're being heard and in being heard, they feel that they're being taken care of and feeling that you're being taken care of at a time like this, at a time when it has been so hard where we've seen so much illness, we've seen so many things happen in our family and friends is basic to being able to go about in the healthiest way possible with our lives and work. Next slide. So the leaders are responsible for the team uh, and they essentially lay out, this is a checklist of what I've just been saying and that they have the visibility that everyone's on board and, and they feel confident and everyone else that working with them feels confident that they're doing the right thing. Next slide. 
leaders and the at the most senior levels as well as ones who the and the frontline leaders uh, have the visibility of and reinforce routines in their organizations, reinforce habits, and they're observant about the problems and stresses that the people that they're working with are experiencing and engage them to help them work through those problems and provide them the support. And if there's a gap or there's a shortfall, then it's the responsibility of the leaders to figure out how to fill that. Next slide. These are the kinds of stresses that I think in walking around, and of course it's figurative these days, but that's what we have to do. Uh, are people feeling isolated? Are they engaged? Do we see that they're exhausted? Do, are there signs that they're having problems with sleep? And some people, of course, have got nightmares. What do they look like? In the Army, of course, we always looked at their uniforms. Were they sharp? Uh, and uh, did they pay attention to what their appearance was? How, do they, how does our staff interact with each other? Are they thoughtful? Are they respectful? Do they listen to each other? All these are vitally important. And this is what leaders do. And this is what frontline managers and leaders do, paying attention to really what's going on in the day-to-day -day work and life of every one of their teams. Next slide. Uh, my good friend of mine, uh, uh, Lieutenant General Mark Hurdling has written this down from his army experience. This is something that uh, we all practiced. Uh, but like Matt was saying, in terms of relationships, uh, we all need a buddy, we need someone to talk to, you plan for things, you know that unexpected things are going to happen, you build your team, remember, and this is why sleep so important, that fatigue makes cowards of us all. So keep up your health, do what you need to do, self-care, huddle with people, and if it's a downtime, then this is where it's so important to have a buddy that can fill in when it's a downtime. Uh, if something happens, explain it, take responsibility, but really respect and cherish everybody on your team. Uh, this is where we build those bonds and this strengthens everyone as you go forward doing what needs to be done. Next slide. So this is uh, fundamentals here of, uh, as Matt talked about what we do on the front lines and the skill sets and habits we think are vitally important. Uh, we think that there are responsibilities and a vision that leaders have. And of course, uh, the most important, very important as well, everyone's important here, but very important are our frontline leaders and our frontline managers, that they have the skill sets so they can get the jobs done. They can support their people who are every day on the front lines and they can be responsible and responsive uh, to the most senior leaders. Uh, we think that it's really important to take these kinds of modules, get them out. Uh, we do this as a charitable activity uh, because we want to do our part. Uh, we're all in this together and we want to help uh, our communities. We want to help all those organizations that are helping us. And this has to be from our hearts and it has to be because of our values because of our ideals and our sense that uh, this is what happens in America. Uh, this is why it makes this country strong. And you know, as an old soldier, uh, this is what we're committed to. So it's been a real privilege. And I wanna again, thank Dr. Gerber and I wanna thank the Silver Health staff and all those people who have supported us and our uh, uh, donor, donors uh, for allowing us to do this because uh, Obviously, it's uh, been rewarding for us to do our part. I'll turn that over now to Dr. Gerber, and we're glad to take any questions, answer anything that, uh, any comments, listen to what people have to say. Andrew. Thanks so much, Steve. I'm, it's so moving to hear you and to hear Matt, and, and it, it's so clear listening to you both why, why this program has been uh, so successful and, and why so many people have expressed such appreciation. So. We've certainly earned the the uh, the positive feedback we've gotten. I don't know if we're going to have time to take questions today. Maybe somebody who's in the organizing phase can can write in or tell me if they'd like me to do anything about that. But there, there were a couple things that I wanted to say before we closed. And why don't I, I 
say those first well, well, and and then maybe we can take some questions in our remaining minutes um you know obviously i wanted to to thank steve and matt and tara and i'm sorry i didn't get to meet her but she's just incredible and and this program would never have happened uh without her but i i also want to thank a, a couple other uh individuals and groups and i'm remiss in my in my um in in my uh, hectic trying to get the link working at the beginning i meant to say this earlier but i want to make sure you all hear it now we have been incredibly uh, fortunate to have some generous donors who really made this program possible um, as, as you all know 2020 was not an easy year for hospitals and that includes financially so the only way we could do this is with that uh, generous support and the, the the king among them the, the real prince among them is is a man named rudy ruggles uh, who we are proud to, to have as a friend and really proud to have as a member of the team. And uh, I know Steve and Matt can tell you and Tara can tell you about how enormously helpful Rudy has been, uh, not just in terms of financial support, but in terms of, of his ideas and his, uh, his camaraderie. Um, Rudy's a wonderful guy and, and I hope, hope some of you get, get to meet and know him. Uh, I also wanted to thank the Tudor Foundation, which uh, is a wonderful uh, a local nonprofit uh, led, uh, we're very privileged uh, by Debbie Shabakov, who happens to also be a board member here at Silver Hill, so she's in dual roles. And uh, she introduced us to Tudor, and, and Tudor uh, helped us uh, um, fund this program. So really, just great generosity uh, uh, of spirit as well uh, in every way that has, has made this possible. So um, uh, we are still accepting uh, uh, support, uh, financial support. This is entirely uh, supported philanthropically. And um, the uh, uh, email address, in case you would like to know more, is uh, resilience, R-E-S-I-L-I-E-N-C-E, -E -E, resilience, at silverhillhospital.org. Um, so please, uh, uh, if you can, even if it's just something small, I hope you'll email us. Uh, you can also go to the website, and there's a link to the donations page as, as well. Oh, there it is up on the screen. I, I didn't even have to read it to you. Uh, so thanks everybody uh, for, for your, th your thoughtful donations. Uh, oh, oh, last but not least, I should mention that, that we've had a, no a number of other uh, generous donors, including, including the board members at Silver Hill Hospital. So uh, they believe in what Steve and Matt and Tara are doing and all of us are doing, and they've been very generous as well. So that's all I wanted to say. Um, maybe we can, unless uh, uh, tell me otherwise, we could take some questions. I've got there are some questions that have been posted in chat, Andrew, and I'm I think a couple of them are really important for us to talk about. Uh, There's a great question about uh, how one remains optimistic when they're dealing with persistent pain or disability. And look, I think at this time and when we this pandemic that maybe more of us than we care to mention. Uh, there are what we're trying to do here in this campaign is we understand that. And uh, uh, in fact, I think that particularly healthcare workers that have faced a lot of difficult situations at the, early on, when they may not have had the resources and not knowing, uh, really have to live with that. In the army, we call that moral injury. Uh, what we're saying is that knowing that, uh, as we've experienced in combat, that the kinds of self-care skills, these will not go away. The pain and disability doesn't go away. But there are things to be done that allow us to live with it. And we've put these modules together so to help people live with, with that kind of hardship or challenge that they've experienced. Now, obviously, there may be times that they want to go for treatment. And uh, we think that that's also important to, to recognize. Uh, but we know that people need to, as we have with our soldiers, after the many, many years of deploying to combat zones, you have to live with that. And these kinds of skills are what help people learn to live with these sorts of challenges. Uh, and the other question is, you know, things happen at home, things happen in our lives. We can't bring those to work. Uh, what do we do with them? We can't share them. Uh, and again, the idea behind these modules is to give some coping skills, give some strategies. Uh, living with those hardships uh, do not go away. Uh, there may be time again that people need to go get some help and uh, we're glad to see what can be arranged for that. Uh, but uh, these are the ways that all of us, these are the best ideas we have 
the best suggestions we have for coping with these very hard, difficult experiences that uh, people, many people are experiencing and have had to uh, now, uh, you know, now is part of their, become part of their lives. Uh, so uh, I, I don't, uh, there's a, there's a question here um, cost to bring this program to a public safety organization. I, I think what we want to say, we've been doing these programs charitably. We are not charging. Occasionally, we've had donations from people. Uh, in fact, we, the way we're set up, we can't charge. We take any donation from anybody who is willing to um, support us. Uh, and uh, we think that if we're going to be most effective, uh, we've got to d continue in this way uh, to do this as a charitable activity. Uh, we want to be part of the community and we want to, we want to help in that way. Uh, so any, anything else? I don't know if you wanted to add anything, Andrew, or any other questions or Matt? Matt, which, anything you'd like to add? I think you all summed it up perfectly. So. If there's any other questions that come in the chat, we'd be happy to answer with a couple minutes that we have left. Great. Yeah, no, I, th I thought you said, you said it uh, uh, beautifully, Steve. And, and listen, I think, I think your experience, yours and Matt's experience uh, in the military has just been essential because um, you, you know, most of American society has never been exposed to this kind of uh, uh, stress and trauma in, in this particular sustained way. They've certainly, been exposed to stressful events, but the, 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 the nature of its extension, I, I think without your, your experience you know, from the military, we would have been stranded, frankly. So I'm so grateful for your willingness and ability to translate across that, that, those, over those lines. Yeah, I think this is, there are some sectors of our society um, that uh, do feel like they've been under for many, many years, been under a lot of stress. But as a society as a whole, we probably haven't seen anything like this since World War II. No. No. And so they're not, you know, uh, our generations don't really remember that. So no. this is a new thing. And uh, I think it's gonna have a ripple effect for many, many years. And I think we've got to continue in order to, to be able to move forward and learn from it and be the country we want to be and do the things that we want to do. So uh, glad to be doing it. Thank you. I think that's a beautiful note to end on because that's, that's certainly something that we all want. So thank you, Matt. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Tara. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. And uh, we look forward to staying in touch uh, uh, about future efforts. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye -bye.